Jesus <clears throat> spent three days and three nights in the grave, how is it possible for him to be crucified on a Friday and resurrect from the dead on a Sunday? <laughs> Friday evening, by the way, and resurrect early Sunday morning. How is that possible? Right? Can't work. So today we're going to officially answer that question, right? I'm very excited about this Bible study, right? Because uh, that took some time, got into a whole lot of um, scriptures and got all the proof for you to substantiate my perspective and my point of view. So let's start as usual with a word of prayer and dive right into it. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord. Uh, oh my God, these days are flying so quick. <laughs> I believe a whole week has gone by. Oh my God. <laughs> you did say that you were shorten the days, eh? So this is to be expected. But um, Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time and this opportunity to gather together, Lord, in your presence. You say where the two and three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst. And we are two and three here, Father God. More than that, we are gathered in your name. We know that you are in the midst. And God, we celebrate your presence right now. We thank you for the manifestation of your presence. We thank you, Lord, as your word is taught, is shared, is discussed, Heavenly Father, that you will... Um, accompany the teaching of your word with signs and wonders following let everyone who attend these bible sessions heavenly father leave not the same way they came in but if there be illness sickness and disease let them leave with healing and health oh god my god if there be financial lack we pray god financial prosperity and blessings father in the mighty name of jesus but everyone anyone comes in here abound in any shape form or fashion i pray god they leave with deliverance god leave god with the liberty of the holy ghost my god father in the mighty name of jesus hallelujah and god we bind every spirit that is not of god we command you to be still and silent in jesus mighty name and father we thank you god for your your manifest presence we thank you for the presence of your holy angels god because you said that they are ministering servants sent forth to minister unto us who are the heirs of salvation hallelujah god today we want to honor you salute you bless and praise and magnify your holy name jesus you are the king of kings and the lord of hosts the conquering lion of the tribe of judah hallelujah <clears throat> and we bless your father we thank you god Help me, God, your servant, yes, me. God, as the oracles of the, In the name God, of hallelujah. Jesus. Help me to speak, Father God, your word and nothing but your word, God, Father, because men's opinion have no power to save, heal, or deliver. Be it far from me to speak my opinion, God, but help me to speak as the oracles of the living God. Only your truth, my God. And Father, we pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would enlighten us, open the eyes of our understanding, that we may see what we couldn't see before, understand what we couldn't understand before. My God, let revelation shine forth, Father. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, and help us when all is said and done, Father. God, to obey you without hesitation and without reservation, Father, so that you will get all the glory and the honor and the praise and that you so richly deserve, Father. Amen and amen. Thank you. Amen. Oh, praise Thank God, you. praise God, praise God. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. God is good. <clears throat> God is good indeed. All right. So, <clears throat> as I said before, today we're going to dive into a little deviation from what we started uh past couple of weeks. Right? We're looking at the proof that the Bible is, in fact, the inspired word of God. And today we're going to deviate from that very slightly. All right, and uh, answer a specific question. If Jesus, and he's, he, he actually said this, all right, let me, let me start by sharing my screen here, okay? He literally said that he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, all right? In the, uh, the grave, he would be three days and three nights, all right? There you go. So you can see the full screen. Wonderful. So if it is he said that he's going to spend three days and three nights in the grave, how is it that we have been celebrating Good Friday as the day that he um, <clears throat> uh, died, uh, the day he was uh, crucified and uh, rose uh, on, on, the, on the, uh, the Sunday? How is that? Because really and truly, when you look at it, it, it just it doesn't track. The, the math doesn't work. <laughs> right? How could Jesus be crucified on a Friday, raised on a Sunday? Uh, but he still said he spent three days and three nights. See, because, uh, you know, as we go forward, um, folks, if you could just mute 
your your uh, mic so that we we'll prevent the, the background noise. That'll be wonderful. Everybody, if you could just mute your mic, please. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. So here's the thing. When I was a baby Christian, first first year I would say, first few months as a matter of, as, as a matter of fact, I asked the question from one of the elders at the church that I attended. I asked the question, um, how come we uh, celebrate Jesus' crucifixion on a Friday? How is that? Because when you check from Friday to Sunday, you can't. that's not three days. It's not three days, you know? And so they say, yeah, yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days. <laughs> that was it, you know? <laughs> but see, here's the thing. Jesus didn't say three days. He said three days and three nights. He was very specific, right? Three days and three nights. Matthew 12, 40. Let's read. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Those words are very clear. We know they were not written in English. Of course, they were written in Greek, right? But the translation is accurate. The translation into English is accurate, okay? Three days and three nights. So I can tell you right now that as you go into this study, you will find that um, you're going to come up with, with several different scenarios. People will try to explain things to you in different ways. Like one of the things they will say is that um, uh, in the Middle East, back in those days, they counted a partial day as a day, even though it's not a full 24 hours. But if it's just a few hours, they would count it as a day. So there were a couple of hours on, on the Friday. Uh, there was a whole day Saturday. And then there was a few hours on the Sunday. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days. These, or this rather is one of the arguments you will hear for people trying to justify a Friday crucifixion. That will not work, right? Even though that is a fact, right? The Jews in those days did count uh, partial days as a day. Uh, it still wouldn't work because of the simple fact he said three days and three nights. It doesn't matter how you cut it. You cannot get three nights from Friday evening to Sunday morning. It doesn't work, right? If Jesus was crucified on a Friday, Matthew 12, 40 cannot be true. Cannot. No one can get three days and three nights from Friday evening to Sunday morning. It is mathematically impossible, right? This must be our starting point to study this, right? This must be our foundation. <clears throat> we're dealing with math. We're dealing with just simple uh, culture and science, right? Uh, we know that the Jews actually count the days from uh, sunset to sunset, okay? That's one of the facts that we have to take into consideration, okay? Um, we in the uh, Western world, using the, the Roman system, we count our days from midnight to midnight, okay? Today is Friday, okay? Right now it's uh, 7, 10 p.m., all right, according to my watch, my clock, and so for us, uh, this is Friday evening. But guess what? For Jews right now in Israel, right? It's Saturday. Saturday started with the moment the sun went down. So it's officially Saturday in Israel right now. You see, because they count their days from sunset to sunset. Okay. And we know the sun doesn't go down exactly the same time every day. But just for, just for, for ease of communication, let's say it's about 6 p.m. Right. Let's just say, you know, for, for easy communication, about 6 p.m. So they count their days from about 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. As whereas as, as we count our days from midnight to midnight. This point is very important as we go forth in this Bible study to understand. OK, and that's point number two. The Jewish day begins at sunset. Point number one is they were th three literal days <laughs> and nights. OK, because this is another one of the arguments you will hear. People will try to tell you it's figuratively speaking and they will dance all around the, that scripture we just read in Matthew 12, 40. They will dance all around that scripture and try to explain it to you in a million different ways how it's not literal. No, it's literal because Jesus drew a reference just as Jonah was three days and three nights. It wasn't literal. It wasn't a figurative, but Jonah he spent three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. And Jesus drew a comparison with Jonah's experience and his experience. So we know it's three literal days and three literal nights that Jonah spent in the belly of the fish. Jesus said he would spend in the heart of the earth. In other words, in the tomb, he would be buried. Okay, three days, three days and three nights. All right, now, we already mentioned this, uh, point number three, a partial day was counted as a day. Okay, 
Point number four, Good Friday. Why do we celebrate Good Friday? It is a Roman Catholic tradition. It is a religious tradition. And friends, please understand as we go forward in all these Bible studies, all these sessions that we're going to go forward in, you're going to hear me talk about different things, different um, religions and cults and, and different um, uh, denominations and sects and what certain uh, uh, organizations believe and what they teach. You'll hear me say these things, right? I will justify everything that I say. <clears throat> if I can justify it, I won't say. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> Roman Catholicism is a religion. Okay, it is not Christianity. It's not the church. There is one church. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, established one church on this planet. The word church is from the 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 um the word uh, ecclesia or ecclesia, depending on how you want to pronounce it, ecclesia or ecclesia. Right? It simply means called out ones. Those that are called out, called out from what nature's darkness, out of the world system, out of death right into life into light into the kingdom of god right call out once so the church is born again christians everywhere on the planet from every nation every culture every language <clears throat> every sect every ethnicity right once you are born again by the spirit and the word of god you are a part of the church the one true church the universal church if you will right that is the body of Christ on planet Earth. Okay? Roman Catholicism is a religion that very closely resembles Bible Christianity. It is not Bible Christianity. They are not more than one church. There was one church. It is the body of Christ. Okay? If you're not born again, you're not part of that church. Okay? So Roman Catholicism is a religion that closely resembles Christianity. And most of the world believes that the Roman Catholic organization represents Christianity or is Christianity. This is a fallacy. It's a mistake. And it has a lot, a lot of problems. It creates a lot of problems for people throughout the world. For instance, <clears throat> even those of us who are actual born-again Christians, we celebrate this Good Friday thing. Okay? We, we talk about it. We teach it. We preach it. We believe it. We celebrate it. It is not scriptural. <laughs> It's, it cannot be scriptural, right? But why is it so celebrated? Because the Roman Catholic organization promoted it and have been promoting it for centuries and because they carry such a weight, such a, a sense of authority, people believe that this is Christianity. What the Pope says, what the Roman Catholic Church says, this is what Christianity is, this is what Christianity says. And that is a fallacy. That's a mystic and it's a problem, okay? This is one of the reasons why you find that I will pick out certain uh, inconsistencies in scripture and teach us on it. So we can begin to see and discern truth from untruth, right? What is accurate biblically and what is not accurate biblically. The Good Friday crucifixion is based on a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of scripture, a misunderstanding of scripture. Let's read John 19, 31. Here's what it says. The Bible says, therefore... Because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. <clears throat> so what do we have here in the scripture? It's saying the day that Jesus was crucified was the preparation day. It was the day before the Sabbath. And he was crucified uh, and he died like 3 p.m. In the, in the afternoon, okay? And so if we're saying that the new day begins at about 6, so they had like about three hours between the time he died till the time the, the new day would start, the Sabbath day would start. And for the Jews in their culture, uh, their religion at that time, their belief to be uh, crucified was to be cursed. And so they couldn't have people hanging up on a cross representing a curse during the Sabbath day, that holy day. And so that's why they went and specifically requested from Pontius Pilate to remove the bodies off the cross before the Sabbath day began. That was the whole uh, situation going on here. So the point here in this scripture is this is the reason why we have that misunderstanding. Because the Bible clearly says here in this scripture, verse John 19, 31, the day Jesus was crucified was the day before the Sabbath. And everybody knows the Sabbath is Saturday, right? So obviously the day before the Sabbath is Friday. That's where you get that misunderstanding from. That's where you get the misinterpretation from. But listen to this. 
See, here's the thing. All right. The, the Sabbath that they're speaking about here is not the weekly Sabbath. <clears throat> That's the situation going on here. And this is what, if, if the people who started this uh, teaching, if they understood scripture, if they knew how to interpret scripture properly, if they simply read, <laughs> right, they would not begin to say, hey, it was a Friday. Why? Because there were two Sabbaths on that week. One was a high Sabbath. And, and this is why uh, the writer uh, uh, here, John, he put this uh, these words here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think it was seven words here or six words. He put these seven words here in brackets. When you put something in brackets, you are drawing people's attention and saying, hey, focus here. This is important. This helps to explain something else. That's what brackets mean. Focus on it. It's important. It helps to explain something else. So he's saying, listen, the day Jesus was crucified was the day before the Sabbath. It was a preparation day. But he says for that Sabbath, not the Sabbath, that Sabbath. So he wasn't speaking about every Sabbath. If you're speaking about every Sabbath, he said the Sabbath, T-H-E. Didn't say that. He said that Sabbath, meaning that particular Sabbath was a high day. That alone should draw our attention to the fact that, hey, this wasn't a regular Sabbath. It wasn't a normal Sabbath. Okay? And if pe the, the, the people who began teaching this, if they had focused on that, they would have gotten an idea as to what really is going on. Right? <clears throat> Watch this. <clears throat> As I said, there were two Sabbaths that week. Two Sabbaths. The first Sabbath was, was what you call a high Sabbath. Now, what is that? What is a high Sabbath? Well, here's the thing. <clears throat> In Israel, there are seven feasts. Okay? Seven annual feasts that God gave to Israel under the old covenant, under the Moses covenant, that they should celebrate throughout the year. Okay? And every one of these feasts uh, was accompanied by a Sabbath day. All right. So you had Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits. You had um, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Weeks, and the Day of Atonement, seven holy days or high days, seven festivals or feasts. Each one had a Sabbath day. Now, the, 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 there's a, a unique relationship between the Passover and the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover is just one day. Right, was supposed to be celebrated on the 14th day of the month Nisan, or Nisan, N I S A N. And on the 15th day, the very next day, began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that feast ran for seven days. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread began with a Sabbath day and ended with a Sabbath day. So whereas the day of Pentecost, sorry, not Pentecost, the day of Passover itself was not a Sabbath day, but the day right after it was the Sabbath day. So it began a Sabbath. And then it ended with a Sabbath seven days later. So it is a, a unique relationship between Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? But the point is, they were considered high Sabbath days, right? Now, <clears throat> Matthew 26, 17 says, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And here's the thing you need to understand as well. <clears throat> Because the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were so closely um, associated one with another, sometimes when they said the word Passover, they, they, they were not just referring to the, the one day, but the entire eight days of, of a festival, of feast, the, the entire eight days, including the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's something that needs to be understood as well. So in this case here, when they say Passover, not just the day of Passover, but they're referring to the whole uh, eight days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Matthew 26, 17, all right? So <clears throat> these scripture verses here in Leviticus chapter 23, <clears throat> they substantiate what I was saying before. These, this is actual scripture verses here. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at the appointed times. These are the instructions that God gave to Israel through the prophet Moses concerning the seven feasts throughout the year. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. See that there? <clears throat> the Lord's Passover begins at twilight, sunset, on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day, that's the very next day, 14, 15. On the 15th day of the month, the Lord's Festival of Unleavened Bread begins. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Sabbath day. First day of unleavened bread, feast of unleavened bread, that day. 
right? That's a Sabbath day, okay? And you can go check it for yourself, Leviticus 23, verses 4 to 7, right? In that chapter uh, 23, he lists all the seven feasts, right? But for our study here, we will need to focus on just uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The point is, these scriptures here support, one, the relationship between the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. One followed the other, one day right after the next. Secondly, the first day was a Sabbath day. Do no regular work right here, right? So I'm showing you scripture to support my understanding and my teaching of the fact that there were two Sabbath days that particular week that Jesus was crucified. Two different Sabbath days, right? You had a regular weekly Sabbath, 52 Sabbaths a year, every week, 52 weeks for the year, right? Every um. Uh, 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 seventh day was a Sabbath. And again, going back to the peculiarness of how Israel uh, celebrated, uh, uh, sorry, not celebrated, but counted their days from sunset to sunset. All right. So on Friday, that was the beginning of the Sabbath. What we would call Friday evening, they would now refer to that as uh, Saturday or sa early Saturday or Saturday morning. Right. So from about 6 p.m. Friday to 6 p.m. Saturday, that was the Sabbath day. That was Sabbath. That was their reg regular weekly Sabbath. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, seven annual feasts, seven high Sabbath days. Leviticus 23 outlines seven feasts containing seven high Sabbath days celebrated annually by the Jews. And I mentioned these before. Right. So, um, again, every uh, session we do of Bible study is going to be recorded. And it's going to be posted on kingdomlearning.com, right? So if you want to just get these here, you can go there afterwards. I'll have it posted there and you can actually take notes and whatnot, okay? <clears throat> but these are the seven feasts. Now, based on what we have discussed so far, okay, that one, he couldn't be uh, crucified on a Friday. The math just doesn't work, right? Two, there were two Sabbath days that week, right? The first was the high Sabbath which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? Based on that, this is the correct timeline for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Wednesday sunset to Thursday sunset, that was the first day and night. Thursday sunset to Friday sunset, second day and night. Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, third day and night. Three days, three nights. That's how you get three days and three nights. Jesus Christ had to have died on a Wednesday. <clears throat> couldn't be a Friday. Couldn't even be a Thursday. Had to be a Wednesday. Buried three days and three nights. Resurrected early Sunday morning. This is the correct timeline. Let's get into some more details. Because I want to show you conclusively. <laughs> right? That is not just my opinion or anybody's opinion that we are discussing here today. We are discussing, in fact, the word of God as it is recorded in your Bible. Very important for you to understand that. This is not somebody's belief. This is not somebody's opinion. This is the word of God, right? And you'll understand the significance of that as we go forward. <clears throat> we believe the Wednesday crucifixion to be the most accurate because Jesus specifically said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again, Mark 8, 31, in the English Standard Version. The focus here is after three days. You see it? So Wednesday to Thursday, one day and night, Thursday to Friday, second day and night, Friday to Saturday, third day and night, after three days, boom, early Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. <laughs> so that's the correct timeline and that is the correct explanation of why it is he could not possibly have been crucified on a Friday. It had to be a Wednesday. There is more. <laughs> There's more, right? And I really like this. this. These two scripture verses here conclusively show if all that you saw so far, you still had some doubts. Watch this. Mark 16.1. Again, in the English Standard Version, it says, when the Sabbath was passed, and I highlighted the word pass. When the Sabbath was passed, it was done, it was gone, Sabbath gone. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So he was already dead, crucified, right? 
So after the Sabbath was passed, now they went to the marketplace, they bought spices, and so they went to prepare the spices so that they might anoint him. Now, Luke takes up this same story. Mark 16, 1, Luke 23, 56, same story. Remember Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what you call the synoptic gospels, right? John is not part of the synoptic gospels. Now, what does synoptic mean, right? It comes from the same root word as synonymous, synchronize, synchronicity. It means telling the same story in line, in harmony, in consistency, one with another. That's what synoptic means. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the same story. They have the same timeline, they follow the same pattern, the same path, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? John is different from the others, right? He, he tells the same story about Jesus and his life and, 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 and burial and crucifixion and resurrection, but he doesn't do it in the same way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. It's not part of the synoptic gospels, right? So the same story that Mark says, the same incident in Mark 16.1, Luke takes up that same story in Luke 23, 56. Here's what Luke says. Then, then what? After they went and they bought the spices, after the Sabbath was passed, and they went and they bought the spices, then they went home and prepared the spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun. Wait a minute. What do you mean begun? We just saw the Sabbath was passed. After the Sabbath was passed, then they went to the marketplace, bought the spices. Then they came home, prepared the spices. So you're saying there were two Sabbaths? Yes, there were two Sabbaths. <laughs> See, if people would read their Bibles carefully and intelligently, you would see that there were no mysteries. There's, there's no contradiction. There's, there's, it's not difficult to understand. Okay, but you have to read and you have to compare scripture with scripture. Okay, the Bible explains the Bible, but you have to read. You have to open it and read and study. All right. So it's very simple. Jesus was crucified on the Wednesday. The next day was the Sabbath. That's the high Sabbath, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, that was the next day. Okay, they could, the woman could go and do nothing. They had to stay home and rest. They can't move about on the Sabbath day. It, that was illegal or unlawful. Right. But after the Sabbath was passed, then they went into the marketplace. Then they could go and, and leave home and travel distances and transact business. So they went in on the regular day, not the Sabbath day. After the Sabbath was passed, they went into the marketplace, bought the spices, brought the spices home. And they didn't have rasterizers and food processors. So simple things that would take us minutes to do or maybe just an hour or two. It took them the whole day to prepare these spices. So by the time they were done, guess what? It was evening time again. And another Sabbath day had begun. This now is the regular weekly Sabbath, Friday evening to Saturday evening. This is the second Sabbath. So in between these two Sabbaths was a regular day when they went into the city, got into the marketplace, bought the spices. Do you see it? These two scripture verses here confirm that there were two Sabbaths that day, that week, right? And the two Sabbaths were separated by a regular day. That's how you get the specific timeline. Died on a Wednesday. Next day was a Sabbath. Day after the Sabbath was a regular day. Day after the regular day, a second Sabbath. <laughs> there you see it, right? So, so, so these scripture verses are very, very clear. As Jewish days are from sunset to sunset, we believe the following to be the correct timeline for Jesus' crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. The Jewish Wednesday, which would have been our Tuesday, Right, if, if you're using the Roman system, our system, Tuesday evening, that would be their Wednesday. Okay, Jesus celebrated the Passover, which we call the Last Supper, when he went into the upper room with the disciples and he said, One of you will betray me. We call it the Last Supper. That was the Passover meal that he was celebrating with them. Okay, then he spent the night in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. This, these are these are the, 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 uh, the activities that he was involved with in the last few hours of his life. Okay. Celebrated the Passover, <clears throat> the Last Supper, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed all night, <clears throat> right? Coming down early in the morning, Jesus was arrested. He was tried and was hung on the cross, right? We call it a kangaroo court. It was unlawful. It was illegal. It was just terrible, right? He was not guilty at all, okay? But he was arrested, tried, and crucified that same Wednesday, he was taken off the cross before sunset because the high Sabbath day began at sunset. Okay. 
Wednesday sunset to Thursday sunset was the high Sabbath, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Thursday sunset to Friday sunset, that would have been the regular day. All right? So you have the high Sabbath day, the regular day when the women went into the city, bought the spices. Then Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, regular weekly Sabbath. All right? Early Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead in victory. This timeline accounts for three days and three nights in the grave, just like he said. All right? There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All right? And to go over it one more time again to give you an overview of the whole process, what happened. Okay? Passover, Last Supper, Tuesday night. Right? And we're looking at it from our perspective, not from the Jewish perspective, our perspective. Tuesday night. Okay? Passover. Garden prayer, Garden of Gethsemane, midnight Tuesday to about dawn and Wednesday. Arrested and tried early Wednesday morning. Nailed to the cross, 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Spent six hours on the cross, died 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Taken off the cross and buried before sunset on that day, which began the high Sabbath day. Okay? And for those of you... <clears throat> one sec. All right. And for those of you who like to get scripture for everything, which I don't blame you, it's a very good, it's a very good thing. All right. I'm gonna have some scriptures coming up for you. All right. Again, high Sabbath, Wednesday sunset to Tuesday sunset, normal day, Tuesday sunset to Friday sunset, weekly Sabbath, Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, resurrection day, early Sunday morning. To be three days and three nights in the grave, he must have been crucified on a Wednesday. All right. And these are the scripture verses to support every single one of those points that I raise. All right. If you're taking notes, you can take notes. Um, but um, again, this is recorded. I'm going to have it up in uh, kingdomlearning.com. Uh, <clears throat> so you can go there and peruse to your heart's content. All right. Once again, Passover last supper, you'll find that recorded in Matthew 26, 17, Garden of Gethsemane prayer, uh, Mark 14, 32 to 42, uh, arrested and tried about 6 a.m., uh, early in the morning when uh, around the same time Peter denied him and the, the cock crew three times and all that that stuff right you find it in John 19 14 nailed to the cross 9 a.m mark 15 25 died on the cross 3 p.m after spending uh six hours and um, I didn't include this here but um about 12 uh, midday <clears throat> the whole place went dark and there were there were all signs and wonders in the, in, in the sky and whatnot right but uh for the 3 p.m. death, you'll find it in Matthew 27, 45 to 50, buried before sunset, Matthew 27, um, 57 to 60, uh, resurrected after three days, Mark 16, 9. Okay, there you have it. So I have given you here enough scriptural evidence to conclusively support the doctrine that Jesus not only was not, but could not possibly be crucified on a Friday. The time would not work, right? Again, to belabor a point, Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, that's one day and one night. If he was crucified on a Friday, then you're counting Friday evening to Saturday evening, one day and one night, right? He, was, he rose early the Sunday morning. That's just a few hours after. So where are you getting three days and three nights? It's literally impossible. You cannot get three days and three nights on a Friday, right? So as I'm really hammering this point home, so that you would leave this Bible study crystal clear in your mind, not from somebody's opinion, but scripturally speaking, it is impossible for Jesus to have been crucified on a Friday. Could not happen. All right. So Everest, why is all this important? I mean, after all of this, these scriptures and these explanations, you know, what's the point? <laughs> why do we need to go into all of this? The fact is that he was crucified. All of us believe that. We believe he was crucified. He died. He resurrected from the dead. That's what's important. Why do we need to be, you know, splitting hairs and then talking about Wednesday and Friday? And that, 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 that confuses the whole issue. We shouldn't be focusing so much on, on, on these minor things. Some people may think, <laughs> right? Some people may think. Let me let me share some things with you, right? And I need for you to listen to me really, really, really carefully, right? I'm gonna go ahead and 
bring up my video and stop sharing. Here's the thing. You see, anytime you start to think like that, you're going to run into some problems. You are going to run into problems. Let me show you some of the problems you're going to run into. We are commanded by God to have a ready answer to them who question us about our faith. That's a command in the New Testament. Have a ready answer. Be able to answer people who question you about your faith. To me, one of the most glaring problems, errors in the body of Christ is this Good Friday. It's so obvious. I don't know how people have not been questioning that seriously all these centuries. I don't, I really don't know. But to me, this is obvious. So you find that you may have a friend, a family member, a co-worker, some associate, okay, who might be bordering, you know, on the fence, thinking about Christianity, they're thinking about them, their, their lives, and they've been hearing the gospel preached and taught, and you know, they're thinking about making the decision. But somehow, when they read the Bible for themselves, they're seeing all these apparent inconsistencies, all these apparent contradictions, and they're confused. They're legitimately confused. Not everybody who says, you know, who question your faith is, is somebody who, who, who wants just to reject the truth and bring up an argument. No, there are some people who are genuinely questioning, well, if and why and how and what. And our responsibility is to be able to give them intelligent, educated answers. A lot of Christians cannot do that. They can't. What they are adept in is cramming scripture verses down people's truth. Or speaking loudly and boisterously. And just trying to, by force of presence and, and, and volume and emotion, win arguments. That's how a lot of Christians conduct their lives. And they think they're, they're witnessing to this person or they're evangelizing. That's not evangelizing. evangelizing. You're just sharing your opinion. Whenever you tell somebody something, if you're trying to lead somebody to Christ and you tell them something, you must be able to substantiate it biblically. Open your Bible and show them scriptures. This is what the word of God says. You know why? Because God said, my word that I send forth, it will not return unto me void but it will accomplish the thing I sent it to accomplish. So the only thing that has the power to deliver, to heal, to save people is God's word, not your opinion, not my opinion, not our belief, not our traditions and customs. They, they are devoid of power. The things that you believe, whatever that thing is, if it's not foundated in scripture, it's useless. I don't care how much you believe it. I don't get much experience you have. <laughs> Your experience and my experience do save people. It, it may help to substantiate a scripture, a doctrine. If we also have an experience, it could lend substance to, a, to an established doctrine. But your experience by itself can't save nobody. It doesn't matter how wonderful your experience is. It has no power to save people. Only God's word can save a human soul. Only God's word can heal or deliver, bless, protect, provide for people. Okay, only the word of God. So why are we studying this? Why, why is this important? Because a soul might be hanging in the balance. Your ability to explain this to somebody may make the difference on whether they go to heaven or go to hell. That's why studying doctrine is important. That's why studying these tricky parts of the Bible, these supposed contradictions and these difficult questions. That's why it's important because a human soul hangs in the balance. There may be somebody out there that you know that you may come into contact with who may question this very same point. How can the Bible be true? How could it be real? How could it be the word of God when there are so much inconsistencies and contradictions? Like what you may ask? And they say, well, for instance, Jesus was supposed to be Three days and three nights buried in the grave from Friday evening to Sunday morning. You can't get three days and three nights. But, you know, before this teaching, what would you have told them? Don't worry about that. That's not important. The fact is that he was crucified. That's nonsense, people. That's 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 nonsense. You can't tell somebody that. It's a legitimate question the person is asking you. It doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, it casts doubt on the veracity of the word of God. They have a right to question these things. 
You can override the person's common sense and intelligence and tell them, but that, that, that doesn't matter. Of course it matters. You are asking the person to base their life on this word, this book. They'll be telling them this is God's word. But there are things in it that don't make sense. People need to know. And we Christians need to be able to explain it to them. That's your job. That's my job. That's our job. It's not just the pastor and the Bible teacher. Every Christian is supposed to be able to answer these basic questions about doctrine. What I've found over the years is that most of us are uh, novice Christians. We're not professionals. We don't conduct ourselves like professionals. Here's the thing you need to understand, people. Your life as a Christian is a job in from the moment you said yes to Jesus and you receive him as your savior, you began to be employed. That's what it means to be a bond servant. Every born again Christian is a bond servant. It means you are employed. This is a job, just like your real job, your, 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 your secular job, whatever you're doing, your business, your job, wherever that is. Okay. Being a Christian is a job. And at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be paid wages for how well you did your job. Part of your job is leading people to salvation. That, In fact, that is the, 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 the crucial, the most intrinsic, fundamental part of your job is the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world to Christ, leading people to Jesus Christ. That is fundamentally the, the, the most important part of your job. How well do you do that? See, when you go for a regular job, there's orientation, there's training. Some of us spend four years going to college to get a degree. Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, right? Master's degree. People spend eight, 10, 15 years <laughs> studying, right? To be doctors and lawyers and accountants and engineers and what have you. To do a job that only rewards you here now. Being a Christian is a job that rewards you eternally. How well do we study for that job? Don't answer. But if I ask the question right now, how many of us here have read the Bible at least one time, cover to cover? How many of us have actually read the whole Bible cover to cover? Right? Don't need to answer. What I've found most times, the answer is never. Right? And you have a lot of excuses why or whatever. Most, most times it's never. Right? I, as a Bible teacher, I should be reading the Bible every single year. Once through every year. I've only read it four times. Only four times cover to cover. To me, that is shameful. Absolutely shameful. I've been serving God for 34, going on 35 years. I should have read the Bible cover to cover at least 20 times. At least 20 times. Being a Bible teacher. Only four times. Shameful. Because God said, whatever he said to you, the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance. So if at least you read it once, he can bring it to remembrance. But if you never read it, he has nothing to bring to remembrance. All right? One more thing, one more reason why studying uh, doctrine and questions like this is important. Apart from you doing your job as a Christian well and leading people to Christ effectively, apart from that, there's coming a day and time when persecution is going to increase exponentially on this planet, in this earth, here in America. It's already started. For those who have eyes to see and ears to, to hear, you can see it. It's already started. Christians will be persecuted. It's happening around the world in different Islamic and communist countries right now. Christians are being martyred. They're being murdered, tortured, raped, imprisoned, treated terribly right now. They're being killed. Heads chopped off, hands chopped off, right? People are being slaughtered in countries around the world right now just because they are Christians, right? That type of mentality is coming to a state near you, to a city in America near you, it's coming. And when the trials and testing times do come and persecution rises, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, your faith is going to be tested sorely. And I'm saying you, our faith, all of us, every single born again Christian in this country and the rest of the Western world, our faith will be tried and tested. Persecution, Christian persecution is on the rise. And if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you will have a hard time. You'll have a hard time. We, this is a time where the time is very, very short. I'm not predicting when Jesus is going to come back. He said, no man knows the day and the hour. I personally believe it's not going to be very long again. A few more years and the rapture is going to take place. That's my personal belief. All right? But between now and that time, 
you're going to see an escalation of persecution for your faith. And if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you will have some problems. So to wrap this all up, this is why it's absolutely necessary, vital, and important to study doctrine, to be able to answer these questions. One, it's a command. Be ever ready to give and answer them who question you about your faith. All right? It's a command. Two, it can mean the difference between life and death, heaven and hell for somebody out there who's genuinely questioning and, and, and don't know if they can believe the Bible. If it's, if it's really the word of God or not, right? But apparent contradictions. You may be able to save that person and be the difference for them spending eternity in hell or heaven. And three, your own faith will be tried and tested. And if you're not sure what you believe and why you believe what you believe, you will have some issues, you will have some problems, all right? 